Hi everybody and welcome back to Cheatash. My name is Chris and today we're starting a brand new journey through a brand new book titled The Clean Coder by Robert C. Martin. That's right, Uncle Bob, the same person who wrote Clean Code, which we did a whole entire series on and wrapped it up uh, about a couple months ago, I think, a month or two ago. There is a companion book to this called The Clean Coder. If Clean Code talked about topics referring to how you should how you should write code and best practices within the act of actually writing and maintaining your apps or code bases, Clean Coder is going to be about how to act as a professional and more maybe, I guess you could say, like the soft skills of being a professional software engineer or software developer. And I actually had this book for a long, long time and just now deciding to read over it again. I actually did start it like quite a while ago and then I never really got through it, but I thought, hey, this would be a great idea to do a series on this for everybody out there in this profession. Um, but even if you're not within this profession, I think this book might bring a lot of value as far as just how to conduct yourself in a work setting. Or if it's not a work setting, if you just want to conduct yourself in whatever passion project that you're doing, whether it's working by yourself or working within a team of people, I think it's going to have principles that apply to no matter what work situation you're in. So I'm excited to dive back into this book and actually finish it this time because I've had this book for a while. Uh, actually, my company sent it to us a while back, so... Without further ado, let's jump in. We're just going to do the introduction sections of Clean Coder. So there's a couple different introduction sections, the first being the foreword, which was written by, let me take a look at the guy's name again. It was Matthew, Matthew Hughes, Matthew Huser, Matthew Huser, who's a software engineer in his own right. And he kind of goes over a little bit of his background and a story from his professional career where he talks about being at a company where he's part of a Batman and Robin type team. So he kind of leads the technical part of it. And then there's another gentleman who leads the, like the business perspective, the business team. So they are kind of operating together in order to make a website uh, go live. So... Their job is to get this website up and running, right? And Matt is like the software development lead, basically. And then the other guy, he deals with the sales, the marketing, getting the technical requirements, basically dealing with the business side, as I've stated before. So they keep working on it and they're working extra hard and they're doing everything on time or maybe not on time, but... They get everything done to the point where they are ready to go live by the date that they set. And just when it's about to go live, he finds out that the legal team did not have the proper enrollment forms for the website. So without getting into too much technical detail, the, the website is going to be selling like a certain product. Uh, the product is of a, of a type selling highly regulated products. Uh, we're operating in a very competitive market when the government opened up a new product. So something with the federal government that they need to have these legal forms in order for a customer to purchase their product. He doesn't really go into a lot of detail, but really the crux of the story is this, that when Matt goes up to his coworker, that's, you know, his Robin to his Batman, they, Matt goes up to him and s with exuberance, with, you know, a can-do attitude says, okay, well, legal still up in their office. They haven't left for the day. Let's go up there and let's just ask them for the proper enrollment forms and we'll get them uploaded right away so that we can still make our go live. And his coworker who's leading the business side keeps deferring, say, oh no, we don't, we're not going to go do that. And he's like, but they're right up here. Let's go crack heads. We've been doing this for the last several months. This isn't anything new to us. So let's just go up there. Let's get it done. 
And the guy says that they couldn't just go to them f- for these new updated enrollment forms because, well, they can just go live next week. And there's a back and forth that happens in the forward where Matthew has an epiphany or like a, yeah, like an epiphany, like a light bulb goes off and he's talking to his coworker who he named Joe. And he's like, Joe, what do you think we've been doing to the engineering team for the past four months? You know, the legal team, they've got all weekend. They've got plenty of time. Let's do this. And then Joe responds to Matt. And this is my bullet point that I have there. Matt, these are professionals. We can't just stare them down and insist they sacrifice their personal lives for our little project. They are professionals. And Matt writes, at the time, I thought the technical staff were professionals in the best sense of the word, but then thinking back over it, I'm not so sure. So when he thinks back over his Batman and Robin relationship, he comes at it from a different perspective. His coworker didn't really view his technical team, the developers, the engineers, as the professionals. They viewed the guys in the upper offices, the suits, I guess not to stereotype, but (laughs) that's kind of the word that I'm going to use. They're the professionals. And the engineers are just doing the grunt work. So Matt has this quote in here where he says, the legal team demonstrated professionalism, but for some reason the technical team did not. It, it 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 didn't display professionalism, even though they see themselves as professionals. For some reason, there was a disconnect. And so Matthew goes on to say, after a while, I suspected Joe would start to think of the technical team as well, professionals, and he'd be right. So essentially, he's giving a preface or a foreword. Yeah, you know, technically this is the foreword of what to expect out of this book. And the to expect out of this book is to transform your behavior from a technician to a professional. So next, we have the preface. And in the preface, who wrote the preface, actually? Okay, I think uh, Uncle Bob wrote the preface where he talks about the uh, Challenger disaster of 1986, so I I don't remember this. I wasn't alive, but I have heard about this where they, the Challenger space shuttle uh, sadly exploded um, like about a little over a minute after the launch, and it was a huge disaster. There was uh, seven, seven people on board the, the shuttle, and they all died, and the preface kind of goes through you know, why it exactly failed. And it failed because of this uh, right solid rocket booster, this SRB. Without getting into too many details, essentially exhaust gases from the SRB leaked and came in fuel. The tank drove, I'm guessing, out of position to smash into the liquid oxygen tank, which then caused the entire solid rocket booster to detach. And you got to you you got to envision that this is all happening so, so fast and quick that when it detaches, it flies off, its nose punctures the liquid oxygen tank, tank, and then everything gets torn to shreds. A lot of technical details in the preface, but really the main point of the preface was the behavior of the people involved in the project and everything leading up to the launch and then after launch. So there were these O-rings that were supposed to form a seal within or around the SRB. They're supposed to keep the exhaust gases from not leaking out, but it essentially what happened was the O-rings failed because it was too cold the evening before the launch. The O-rings stiffened. They couldn't be as, as pliable or flexible. So the stiffening allowed for the leakage of gases. So... The main story is that there was engineers who tried to warn managers at NASA and at Morton Theokal. And Morton Theokal was the company who designed the SRB. So the engineers knew that this could be a problem, that they couldn't really, the O-rings would have trouble functioning in such low, low temperatures, which is what happened the evening before the launch. And... They tried to warn people, but the managers up at the top levels just ignored them. 
and Uncle Bob asked, well, could what could have been done? Obviously, the managers had willful, maybe not willful, but um, they made poor, very poor decisions that cost the lives of all those on board. But could the engineers have done more? Because in a sense here, this is kind of telling a similar story to Matthew's story in the foreword, where it's, again, the people higher up are seen as the professionals and they can make the decisions, but the engineers are just viewed as you know, they're, they're the, the grunts. They're, you know, not, they're, they're not a professional position. So should the engineers have done more or could they have done more? And if you look at the story, you kind of think like, gosh, they did everything they could. They made all these warnings. They didn't even want to watch the launch because they thought that there's such a great chance that something bad could happen. But could they have done more? They did everything they could within the system. But could they still have done more outside of this system? Could they have contacted a newspaper? And he says in the in the preface here, could they have you know called Dan Rather on the ABC Evening News or whatever Dan? I remember Dan Rather being on TV. But could they have gotten in contact with somebody higher up and say, "Hey, you need to investigate this," right? The whole point of this book, and he lays out a couple bullet points on what this book will be about, but it's essentially about behave as a software professional. And that's essentially what this book is going to be about. The last section, oh yeah, and there's a responsibility to act as a software professional. Uh, This last section here, we're going to skip the acknowledgments and then we're going to go to the prerequisite introduction, which is essentially... Uncle Bob talking about some of his his experiences because there was a time where Uncle Bob did not follow the principles in this book. And I'm guessing he didn't really follow the principles of clean code maybe even either. Or maybe he did, but it's essentially he wants to let it be known that he made all the same mistakes that we might be making now or we haven't made yet. And it's a way to look at his life and these principles in these books and not make the same mistakes as he did. And professionalism is what the software engineering field direly needs. The book is going to show you, you know, all the attitude program. He talks about that at his first company, ASC. He, um, he develops a real-time accounting system for the Teamsters. And actually, that's a pivotal moment in his career because he spends so much time working on that accounting system and he feels like he doesn't get justly rewarded for it. His raise was like barely anything, even though he spent 70, 80 hours a week working on it. And he ends up quitting in a fit of rage without having a job lined up. His his kind of early life here, we're talking in his early teens, starts to, to kind of sputter. He he doesn't have a job. He stops working. He he doesn't really leave the house. He's still living at home with his parents. He ends up actually getting rehired at ASC, and he talks about swallowing some humble pie in that process. And he gets rehired, actually, at a reduced salary than what he was making before. And he said he needed to eat that humble pie and essentially work his way back up um, to become a good employee, a good professional. And over the course of his career, he said he's been fired or nearly fired for a bunch of different things. So he's missed critical dates. He's leaked confidential information. He's wrote a project into the ground, has not asked for help, even when it was being run into the ground. And he's gotten other people, unfortunately, fired. And he says, you know, learn from the mistakes that I did. The book is a sort of set of guidelines to avoid the same mistakes as Uncle Bob did. And that's what we're going to hope to accomplish throughout this book. Continuing on next time with chapter one about professionalism. And that's where we're going to leave it today. Just going over just the brief introductions. 
Um, I know maybe this really isn't too much of an important section. Maybe it didn't even need a video, but just to kind of introduce the book, what can you expect from the book? And I guess the biggest thing that I learned from these opening sections is that, and I kind of see it uh, maybe a little bit at work too, where it's like the the engineers are not really seen as professionals. So are there things that you can do that can make you into a professional so other people see you as a professional and I definitely think as far as me I think there is I think there are things that I can do to be a better professional software engineer like like if you're a professional athlete and to be seen as and treated as a professional athlete you know because these guys have agents and they got families and they have to make business decisions Training yourself is not an amateur anymore. You're not an amateur. You're a professional football player or basketball player or hockey player, et cetera. So that's going to do it for today, guys. Uh, thank you so much for listening. To uh, Next time, we'll be back with Chapter 1. Um, I'm going to take a break from Eloquent JavaScript, and I'll try to work in those videos too. We'll do uh, small little bits and pieces, lessons from that book. Uh, let me know what you guys think. If you have any questions, can't wait to read this book. And thank you guys so much for listening. My name is Chris. This has been Cheat Tash. Take care, everybody.